1989. I'm in the Navy on the USS Joseph Hughes, and we have just left our home port of Charleston, South Carolina. We're about to go across the Atlantic Ocean, through the Med, the Suez Canal, into the Indian Ocean, and we're going to be back in six months. Family, friends, home, everything left behind for six months. We're just 300 random guys thrown together. They don't care if we like each other. This is needs of the Navy. 300 guys who just got to make this work. And the needs of the Navy dictate that there are five people you need to navigate this ship around the clock, and I was one of them. And we had Torres. He was this tall, thin Puerto Rican from the Bronx. He joined the Navy soon after his brother had been murdered. And the Navy was a way to get himself and his girlfriend out of harm. And he and I, we got along or we couldn't stand each other. We never were buddy-buddy. But I always admired his New York City swagger. And how he could always say, I'm from New York. Unlike me from a town on near the border of Illinois and Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, we had McCrory. This guy, I didn't like him because he had some reason for not liking me. He had his big belly and he was always pulling at his thinning hair and reading brochures about hair growth possibilities and wondering if he spent his money on that. And we, and we worked for this chief who was like a textbook military guy. He, he was not a guy, he was a sailor and he treated us like sailors, not people. If it wasn't about the needs of the Navy, he didn't want to hear it. Girlfriends, feelings, getting along, nothing. And we were on this ship, and on the fifth day, we're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. 50-foot waves in this storm. And there's no driving around or waiting for a storm. We just had to get through it. And 50 feet, that's like a five-story building's worth of water just showing up and slamming down on this ship. The ship wasn't even 50 feet tall. So it's completely covering the ship, and it's rocking, and it's rolling, and it's black out there in the night. And I can't see past the bow of the ship that's just bobbing in the water, and these swells would take the ship way up high, and then it disappear and turn into a wave, leaving the ship hanging in the in midair, just slam down and vibrate. And three-quarters of the ship is seasick, and we can't go to bed. Somebody's got to keep the engines rubbing, running and drive the ship and navigate and cook food and everything. So we just had to work. And I'm up there on the chart table and I can barely stand up because seasickness, man, eyes can't focus, body shifting from too hot to too cold, throwing up till there's nothing to throw up. And behind me in the darkness, I hear boom. There's a silhouette of Petty Officer Reed. He has dropped down onto the deck. And his supervisor said, Reed, get up off the deck. I wish I was dead. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm thinking, no, I can't have this because I feel like crying and dropping to the deck. And he's giving me permission. No, don't name this thing. And his supervisor said, Reed, go hit your rack. Okay, good. And then in one smooth motion, as he stood, he opened the bridge door and slipped out and the door closed behind him. Okay, he can go to bed. We will get this ship through the storm, through the Atlantic. And I, as my watch finished, McCrory, he came to relieve me. And he is one guy I could count on to be on time. He had nasty comments. He was irritable from being seasick himself, but he relieved me on time. So we got through the Atlantic, we got through the Med, and then the next challenge was the Suez Canal. And typically five guys can navigate this ship one at a time rotating around the clock. But getting through the Suez because it's narrow and it's shallow, 
all five of us had to be up. And it takes three days to get through the Suez Canal. Five guys up three days. And we had to be precise. And it might sound something like this. Okay, stand by to take a round. Take a round. Alpha 068 Foxtrot 217 Zulu 311. All right, Sierra Hotel, guys, good, good. Keep it tight like that. Keep it going. And it had to be like that with these five guys for three days around the clock. Stand by to take a round in 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes like this. And in those 15 minutes, somebody could go to the bathroom, one person, not two. Who is on the verge of not being able to hold it? Okay, you go and come back. Also, somebody might be able to go get food and bring it back. And Torres comes to me, says, all right, uh, what do you want for lunch? And I look at him. Oh, it's payback time. Because at breakfast when he wanted scrambled eggs and three slices of bacon, I brought him a big cold pancake and 10 slices of bacon. Now it's my turn. All right, I want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and milk. And he comes back and the peanut butter and jelly sandwich just got like a half pound of peanut butter, a half pound of jelly. The jelly is soaking through the bread and it's just this big nasty mess. <laughs> you got me, you got me. But we got two more days of this. Yeah, but those, those pranks, they were, they somehow, as, as strange as they were, they, they kept the morale up, just messing with each other like this. And then we're, we're rooting for each other when our fixes are tight. And we got that ship through the Suez. And never, we didn't run aground, no problems. But we were exhausted when it was over. And we make our way into the Indian Ocean and find out these two months, we're going to have a brief stop in Singapore and Pakistan, a total of maybe 10 days out of two months. And what happens when we spend that much time out at sea? Cigarette smokers get weird because there's no more cigarettes in the ship store. We go to breakfast, and when the choices are scrambled eggs or omelets, we know we eat powdered eggs. No, give me the big cold pancake. And I had gotten tired by that time of the few cassettes that I brought, my funk cassettes, the Prince cassettes, Belle Biv DeVoe. And it felt good when a guy loaned me some George Strait and Dwight Yoakam, <laughs> and I could put my headphones on, lay in my rack, close the curtain, and listen to how all George Strait's exes live in Texas and why he hangs his hat in Tennessee. So nice. And then we got a word that the helicopter was coming and we don't know what it's gonna bring. It might bring needs of the Navy kind of stuff, equipment, replacement supplies, uniform items. But when that helicopter came, there is nothing as glorious as seeing it lower down a pallet of real eggs and bags of mail with letters from my fiance in it. Because that kept us sane and cooperative. So we made our way, we got through those two months and we made our way back through the Suez, back through, through the Atlantic Ocean and back to Charleston. And I got out of the Navy a year and a half later. And today when I hear veterans talk about they miss the guys from the battlefield or the ship, I hated being in the Navy. But there is something to be said for 300 people who did not pick each other, who can openly not like each other and not like the situation, but they somehow make it work. And to this day, 
I still like some guitars and Cadillacs and hillbilly music alongside my funk, my P-funk, my uncut funk, the bomb. Keep it going for us. <laughs>